Within living memory, Britain was the largest country in the world and ran India, one of the largest and most populous nations on the planet. This tiny island ruled the world within the lifespans of people alive today. For young people like myself, it's easy to forget how big and how recent colonialism was. How Europe colonized almost the entire planet and dominated the globe for 500 years. At the time, colonial empires were seen by the Europeans as civilizing forces that they were doing out of goodwill to the colonized. My namesake Rudyard Kipling called it the white man's burden. However, today our society has made a 180 degree turn on this issue. The West now treats colonialism as the worst thing to have ever happened, and now constantly apologize and flagellate itself over it. The problem with both of these worldviews is that they're too extreme. This video is about if colonialism was a positive or a negative to the world in the course of history. This video is going to go through the history of colonialism to see if the pros outweighed the cons. Through this process, we'll tackle many sacred cows and myths that our society is terrified of looking at honestly. For God, gold, and glory to the new world and beyond. I have a special integration this time. My friend Philippe Fabry, who does the same kind of stuff as I do in France, has recently translated several of his books into English. His theories have been a big influence in my own, where he's developed theories for the cycles of history, and he's also a fan of what if I'll test. Some of those include he's spoken about the parallels between the Romans and Americans and the Greeks or Europeans. He figures out civilizational cycles as well as patterns for how nations develop organically and what stages of empires countries go through. He also uses this to predict the future, in which he thinks the Western world will have conflicts with Russia and China in the future, while America falls into civil wars like the fall of the Roman Republic. He just translated two books in English. One fits this video topic really well, which is an analysis of the cycles of imperialism with rise, fall, and reclaim, which talks about how the patterns from Napoleon or Hitler show China or Russia's future imperialist phases. If you like What If I'll Tist, Philippe Fabry's work is the closest thing you'll find anywhere. Check out Fabry's books through the Amazon link below. He's also recently started an English YouTube channel, the link to which is also below. To get started, let me use myself as an example for the effects of colonialism. I'm named Rudyard William Lynch, and in the current cultural context, I'm part of the political right. Thus, people might believe that I'm an unalloyed supporter of colonialism. However, the truth, like absolutely everything else, is much, much more complicated. My mom's side's mostly English, the nation that had the biggest colonial empire in history, with colonies on every continent on Earth. My family immigrated to America in the 1600s, clearing the land and fighting the native tribes. They're a prime example of people who benefited from colonialism. However, my dad's side's Irish. We ignore this today, but numerically far more Asians or Europeans were colonized than Native Americans or Africans. The Irish were a colony of the English, where the English killed off the entire Native Irish ruling class, attempted genocide, evacuated the Irish from a quarter of their island, replacing it with settlers, forbade the Native Irish from voting, owning property, or obtaining an education in their native country. The Irish were brutally oppressed serfs in their own country. On both sides of my family are people who benefited and who took a lot of losses from colonialism. I can already hear people typing, you're white, it's not the same. This brings up the next point about this debate. The effects of colonialism are heavily politicized today, and talking about it honestly is impossible without causing mass offense and political crying and emotion. The truth gets blurred when politics are in play. The reason people say white people were never colonized in the same way as other ethnicities and people of color is since white people are successful today, even though that was absolutely not true at the time. The way the British treated Ireland was comparable, if not worse, than Kenya or India. People don't really care about what actually happened in colonialism, they just want to use it as fodder for their political views today. My favorite era of history is the Middle Ages, and people often ask me, what was life like in the Middle Ages? Or, what was the tax rate in the Middle Ages? And the thing I'll have to say is, you know you're describing a 1,000 year period that covered multiple continents. 
And it's the same with colonialism, where the period of European colonialism, which we're going to discuss here, happened over 500 years with so many nations and on every continent on Earth. And so just be aware that there is a lot of diversity in the period we're talking about and that we'll have to make some generalizations here. In this video, we'll be looking at Europe's colonies from 1500 until roughly 1950, since that's what most people mean when they talk about colonialism. One of the points people rarely understand is that in a lot of ways, this is an arbitrary metric. Nations have had colonies since the dawn of time. Sumer colonized Akkad, China colonized Vietnam or the Romans Britain. Every society since the dawn of time everywhere in the world has colonized other peoples. People often talk at the European colonial empires like they're some kind of special evil, while the reality was at the exact same time, the Turks, Mughals, Songhai, and more had their own colonial empires. For a lot of the period we're talking about, the Asian empires were much, much larger than those in Europe. I mean, the Europeans have been colonizing each other for thousands of years, with the Roman Empire being the easiest example. The biggest problem in our philosophy is that we compare society to utopia rather than other historic societies that are comparable. People often say capitalism makes poverty, or greed causes war. The reality is that poverty, war, and oppression are normal across the world in history, and in every single society since the dawn of time, whether the pharaohs, capitalism, communism, or feudalism. Rather than saying what systems cause poverty, war, and oppression, we should be really grateful to those which bring us wealth, peace, and freedom. This is a view that originally stems from Gnosticism. Gnosticism believes that the world is an evil conspiracy, and a few enlightened ones whose souls are freed from the evils of the world have discovered that. They have the hidden truth and are meant to fight against the sinfulness of a world run by Satan. This is a view which gradually evolved into communism, Nazism, and the modern left, who view the world as an evil, oppressive conspiracy by a few elites, while the anointed and enlightened who know how to make a better world should team up to destroy the world's evil. This is a worldview which holds the average baseline view of reality as a moral evil rather than just how the world works. It doesn't judge it against how the real world has been shown to work, but rather how they want it to work. In the modern left today, there's no way to distinguish what people want to believe and what's actually the truth. In this video, we will be comparing European colonialism against other societies in history, rather than a perfect abstract. Through this perspective, European colonialism is a very normal event over history, just on a larger scale given the Europeans gained technological and sociological edges over their opponents. Look at Ali Bai or Emperor Tiger Star's map videos to see how much borders change over history. The short answer, pulling from Matthew White's book Atrocities, which chronicles the 100 bloodiest events in history and is the most respected source on that topic, what you see is that European colonialism was pretty bloody, but it wasn't abnormally so over the course of history. There were some really nasty colonial events. These include the British famines in India, which killed 30 million people, in which there was no parallel either before or after British colonization. Leopold's conquest of the Congo had 8 million deaths, truly making it one of the most brutal events in all of history, since that was a little bit less than half of the Congo's population. Then the entire European colonization of the New World killed around 15 million people, almost all of whom were concentrated during the Spanish colonization of Mexico or Peru. Finally, the Atlantic slave trade had a similar death toll around 15 million. These are horrible numbers, and I don't want to discount that the people who lived through these, it was a horrifying tragedy, but there's nothing particularly abnormal about them. The Muslim slave trade, unlike the European, killed around 20 million people. The Muslims had their own empires with genocides, such as the Armenians or Jews, or the brutal invasion of India. Eight out of the ten bloodiest wars in history were fought in China, and the Japanese have also been brutal colonizers, killing 20 million. The medieval Mongols killed staggering numbers of people, approaching 80 million. The great irony is that for the last few decades, the biggest critics of colonialism have been Marxists, but they score so much worse than colonialism. Mao killed 40 million people, Stalin 20 million, and other communists over 20 million. Marxists criticizing colonialism for being bloodthirsty is the pot calling the kettle black. However, another point here is the Europeans have killed far, far more of each other than people of color. 
Europeans have been killing millions in the Thirty Years' War, Napoleonic Hundred Years' World Wars, and more. And people criticized the Europeans' treatment of people of color, which on average was worse than that of Europeans. Europeans have committed genocide against each other, as most obviously seen with the Holocaust, forced them onto reservations or kicked them off their land, as we've seen with the Irish and Acadians, locked each other in concentration camps with the Boers, and anything else you can think of. We have unrealistic views about this today, given we think that war is impossible, and after World War II, we decided just to freeze borders, and wars of expansion were always evil. However, this is a trauma reaction to how horrible the world wars were that can't account for reality. You can't freeze the world map. In fact, what sounds reasonable is really a very conservative stance, since it holds that the current ruling powers should dominate the world forever. Imagine if we just froze borders and empires in any other year of history. World War I, even for how awful it was, was necessary since social institutions had stratified and fossilized, and the world needed violence and a crash to reset to a more healthy place. Imagine if Austro-Hungary was still a country today, or if Britain owned all of East Africa. Due to this, war is the norm over history, and we must see war again in the future. As Argot's masterful book War and Human Civilization, which I think is one of the best ever written, talks about how war is necessary to human society, and covers the history of war and how war influences human culture. We tend not to ask the question, why do we wage war? However, the reality is that war is normal, peace is not. Peace happens once war is no longer economical, since one power is so great that it doesn't make sense for any other players, such as the Pax Romana, Britannica, or Americana. For all of human history before World War II, there was a principle named the right of conquest, which is that a conqueror deserves the land he conquers from the local people. This sounds like a brutal principle, and it is, but for a second, let's not view it as a statement of how the world should be, but how it really exists in fact. The reality is, whether or not we like it, the right of conquest is how the world works. Every country in the world got its land from conquering it from someone else. The reason Russia or France have the borders they do is because of war. The state exists predominantly to defend or manage a certain geographic region, and if it fails at that, it stops being a real state and someone else takes over. We act like this isn't the way the world is today, but the only reason East Germany and North Korea existed at all was right of conquest by the Russians. The reason Bangladesh or America are independent is because their militaries took it. The reason Texas or California are part of America, not Mexico, is right of conquest. The problem we have today is that we live in a historical aberration, the Pax Americana, in which the Americans have agreed to block any attempts to conquer territory by other players. I see people act as if we're just too enlightened to have empires today. The reality, though, is that today the U.S. acts exactly like an empire, with armies, bases, and navies. Meanwhile, countries like Russia and China are openly imperialistic, wanting to expand their territory. Hell, we're even seeing a war in Niger now, where France maintains what really amounts to an empire in West Africa. Peter Zihan talks a lot about this point today, but since the Americans protect global trade, you don't need a strong military to survive as a country. However, this is a historical aberration. In previous eras, if you wanted to trade your goods, you needed a strong navy. You needed a military to protect your borders, and your neighbors were constantly scheming to conquer you. When you conquered your neighbors, you didn't treat them well, since you knew and remembered a time when they conquered you and did the same. This is just how the world's been for forever before the Pax Americana. This wasn't really viewed as good or bad, just the way the world worked. I often see comedians or members of the chattering classes today make snorky remarks, isn't it so weird the Europeans would invade other people's land to take their stuff? The short answer is no, since standards were much lower. When people talk about slavery, they don't keep in mind that these were societies where most free people lived in abject poverty, and so there was a legitimate intellectual argument the slaves lived better lives than the free poor, since they were economically more secure, and they'd be poor either way. To be clear, I don't support slavery. In many videos, I've said it's one of the worst things you can do to a society. However, the fact that most people over history did means that this is a more complicated and money issue than we give it credit for. In this scarce world, the choice for colonialism was if you would help your country's poor at the expense of another country's. The idea of colonizing the new world was a ray of hope for millions of desperately poor people. 
The precedent that we're trying to judge the rest of history from exists in only a handful of countries for 80 years, and we can't hold on to it, so we're judging the entire human experience from a very weird sliver of history. We're not better people today, we're just richer and more complacent. We tolerate loads of horrible stuff when it's not in our immediate view, whether the close to slave labor conditions that make our clothes, mine the ships for our phones, factory farming, and our society tolerates cancel culture or modern witch burnings over very minor things. In our society, just go online and you'll see that we're incredibly cruel to each other. If you look at Twitter, it's impossible to believe the average person has advanced beyond witch burnings to real tolerance and humility. I remember right when the Ukraine war started, which, by the way, I do support America's role in, there was a poll where a majority of left-leaning Americans wanted to have a war with Russia to support Ukraine. Then I thought to myself, you guys criticize the rest of history for being bloodthirsty, but you want to start a war that would kill millions of people on just a whim like this for a country that explicitly chose to not be our ally and put itself under our protection. Again, we're not more moral, we're just in a position where we're safe enough to pretend to be. The fact of the Ukraine war and China preparing to invade Taiwan also shows that we're not beyond war today. We keep on calling people in the 19th century racist, but remember, Britain ended the Atlantic slave trade and then made it so that other countries also couldn't practice it around the world. The northern United States lost hundreds of thousands of people to end slavery in the South. Would Gen Z today really be willing to die for the things they care about? I'm going to be discussing a lot of objectively horrible things here, like the Spanish invasion of Mexico, which killed millions of people, or the African slave trade. I know the Europeans did some really bad things in colonialism, but I want to play the devil's advocate to explain for some of the reasons why they did. If we want to get into the heads of colonizers a little bit more easily, keep in mind how weird and fast globalization was. Imagine a human ship is finally able to reach another planet. The native peoples there are completely different from us, and they sacrifice their own people to the gods, practice cannibalism, and worship a god that looks like our Satan. They then attack our men the first second we land. Upon discovering this alien species, how many people on Earth would want to wipe them out in an instant before they could do anything or get more dangerous? I actually think most people on Earth would support that. Orson Scott Card's books are about this. The thing is, the situation I described is exactly what the discovery of Mexico by the Spanish felt like. The people involved didn't know if the Native Americans were even human, and there was a big debate about if they had souls. It's easy for us to say how bad racism was in retrospect, but we're not in a world anymore when you run into another culture, they practice cannibalism, human sacrifice, foot binding, and more. Imagine you're from a very religious society, and then you discover a population which does all the things you were told are evil ever since childhood. The assumption going into the African slave trade was that Africans weren't fully human. I know that worldview was partly created to enslave Africans, so it's not an excuse, but keep in mind that these were societies that didn't have the scientific tools to the same degree we have today, and so when they saw Africa's lower level of development, ascribed it to intrinsic intelligence among the Africans, rather than other factors like historical chance or geography. In a society where animals work for free, and almost all Europeans lived in poverty and worked for close to free, and where all the scientists and cultural authorities said Africans were inferior, you can see why this society thought a slave trade was acceptable. There's always multiple sides to a story, and another side to the African slave trade was that the Europeans hadn't practiced slavery for 500 years before it. And there was an assumption at the time that slavery was inherently wrong. And we know from diaries and records that the Europeans did feel a lot of guilt for practicing slavery. There's also the side that the Europeans were doing something that they knew to be objectively morally wrong. We like to whitewash these events and make them clear European versus native wars, while the reality is that they're much more complicated and bloody. The vast majority of people who bought and sold slaves to Europeans in the African slave trade were black. 90% of the Spanish armies that attacked Mexico or Peru were native. 90% of the soldiers that fought for the British in India were Indians. Native peoples were happy to work with European colonizers to get an advantage over their local rivals. 
An example I'll throw out is that the Huron and a lot of other tribes in the East United States worked with the French, and they didn't view it as betraying their people because they were using the French to help fight against the Iroquois, another native tribe, which committed genocide against the Huron and depopulated a thousand-mile area from Buffalo to St. Louis. Both sides, not just the Europeans, were brutal here. People give the Tlaxcala a lot of crap for teaming up against the Aztecs, but the Aztecs were a giant empire that had killed millions of people and was trying to conquer the Tlaxcala, and then the Tlaxcala, by siding with the Spanish, gave themselves kind of the positions of being a new nobility inside the Spanish Empire, and the Spanish gave them pretty good self-governance until the fall of their empire, so it was only a betrayal from their entire race's perspective, not that of their individual people. As a personal example, on my mom's side, I have five ancestors who died fighting the Indians in the colonization of the U.S., and the native peoples of the United States, like the Iroquois or Huron, would after capturing someone, torture them for days by ripping their skin off and then eat their hearts as a way to get their strength. And I know the Europeans genocided the natives and wiped them out, but in every single frontier, the natives did things that gave the Europeans a right to hate them, even though the Europeans often did terrible things back for the natives. And there are no angels in the story, and these were incredibly brutal wars. An important factor to keep in mind is that the kinds of people who would sail for months on end to dangerous places, where they would probably die to make their fortunes, tended to be very hard and sociopathic guys. This selection for sociopaths, and on top of that, the Europeans having such advanced technological abilities allowed them to get carried away. Colonialism was almost always done by small groups of aggressive men without any oversight. Colonialism was never planned by European governments. What happened instead was that companies would organize colonization and then they would tell their countries that they had a colony in blank after doing it. In a lot of cases, the governments couldn't control the process even if they wanted to. As an example, let's look to the Spanish conquest of Mexico and Peru, where Cortes and Pizarro just got a couple hundred buddies together, discovered those empires, and then conquered them for Spain. The Spanish government literally couldn't have done anything, since they had no idea those areas existed before they conquered them. A very apt comparison in recent history is with the digital and tech revolution where these computer whizzes made these massive platforms and breakthroughs that changed the world, and actually tech VC and startup organization is very similar to the colonial companies and expeditions in the Age of Discovery, but because the government had no clue what was going on, large and massive effects, many of which were negative, occurred, like female depression and suicide rates have quadrupled, male virginity has tripled, political radicalism has skyrocketed, and in the same way the European governments couldn't keep tabs on what was going on in the colonies since it was thousands of miles away, the average U.S. senator is 75 years old, and so he has no clue how to deal with these services. What often happened was that the centralized governments came in afterwards and tried to clean up the excesses done by the colonial companies and adventurers. Two easy examples are the British East India Company and with Pizarro in Peru. Pizarro, Clive, and Columbus were all put on trial by their own governments for atrocities, so it's not like the centralized governments didn't care what was going on in the colonies. The Spanish government went to great effort to try to protect the Native Americans from complete slavery, but the problem was that since the empire was so big, they just didn't have the ability to really control the oppressive conquistadors on the ground. The British government passed a law in 1763 to prevent American settlement west of the Appalachians to protect the Native people. But the American settlers refused to accept this, settled it anyway, and then caused a revolution that resulted in the British losing America. This process of European governments trying to restrain their own settlers happened many times, and almost always failed. I was reading a book by the journalist John Gunter, who was the most famous of the post-World War II era, and he was visiting 1950s Africa and went to Kenya, where there was a apartheid system with a very stark racial line between whites and blacks. One of the biggest sticking points is the native blacks weren't allowed to go to the colonial country clubs that the whites had. This might not sound like a big deal, but the country clubs was where the elite met and governed the society. 
And this might sound racist today, and it literally fits the definition of being racist, but when the British first colonized the region, the technological and social level between the native Africans and the British was 2,000 years. Objectively, the native peoples of Kenya had a technological level equal to Britain's before the Roman colonization, with no literacy, roads, or centralized government. When the British first colonized the region, this very split society made sense since they were on such different levels of development that no other systems could realistically work. The problem later on was that as the Africans caught up with the British, and by the 50s, there was a sizable native African educated class, the British had no plans to let the Africans in on the British's institutions. This is a major problem we'll see again and again with colonialism, that institutions that were formed when the empire was originally created gradually stop working as the society changes and the locals acclimated to European standards. As a general life rule, if you see someone doing something that makes absolutely no sense to you, try not to judge them and think, what assumptions are they starting with and are those assumptions actually correct for the world they live in? And you find that that completely changes your perspective on the world. There's a really good book named The Rule of Empires, which goes through a series of imperial conquests ranging from Roman Britain and Arab Spain to British Kenya or Spanish Peru. It makes a couple fascinating points. One detail is that the author always shows an example of the colonizing country being colonized themselves, like the Romans colonizing Britain and then the French colonizing Italy, and it shows that everyone gets pwned by the wheel of history at some point. However, the thesis of the book is that empires are never made in good faith, which I agree with. If you look at the conqueror's policies, they always benefit the ruling elite and the conquering ethnicity. Even at Rudyard Kipling's time, in the high imperialism of 1900, where there was a lot of rhetoric around the white man's burden and positive colonialism, the usual result of conquest was division of the native people's land and then looting their society. It's normal for the conquered to be excluded from many privileges and rule of their own society be treated as second-class citizens inside their own nation. India benefited from the railroads, government, science, law, military, and more that the British gave them. However, the British gave them those institutions since it made India easier to govern. This is clearly shown in how the British let 30 million Indians starve without raising a finger. Sashi Tarur's Inglorious Empire does a good way of showing how the British viewed the native Indians with contempt, and even the things the British did, like irrigating large amounts of Pakistan, were done to increase tax revenue. However, that doesn't mean the conquered don't accrue benefits from empire, which they often do to a tremendous amount. A point Dan Carlin made is that once you strip away the positives of empire, which often take centuries to accrue, such as unity, government, technology, and trade, the great men who form empires, such as Genghis Khan, Julius Caesar, and Alexander's main accomplishments in life have been the death of millions. If we throw the baby out with the bathwater, we remove modern science, medicine, technology, democracy, the Columbian exchange, human rights, and more out the window. Colonialism is synonymous with the modern world. The non-European societies, except Japan, were completely unwilling to adapt to the modern world without force. The Chinese, Indians, and Muslims only accepted modern science after their empires burned and their failings became completely obvious. These societies would still be medieval today without colonialism as they were just a hundred years ago. Africans can be very plain about how dependent their societies are upon colonialism, how the institutions they depend upon are based off European forms, how the only trains and roads that work are those who are built by the Europeans, or the only way they can communicate across their large multi-ethnic nations is through English or French. A complicated point here is that the effects of colonialism aren't just related to colonialism itself. For example, the average African was unaffected by European colonialism during colonialism. Remember, the Europeans only ruled Africa for 60 years and were normally 0.01% of the population. Thus, the effects of colonialism, such as modern technology, Christianity, a money-based market, or the centralized nation only reached the normal African decades after colonialism ended. On a purely numeric basis, colonialism, or really modern technology, have saved far more lives than they've hurt. 
Just as an example, the spread of clean water and anti-malarial medicine, both of which brought by the Europeans, have saved hundreds of millions of lives. This is one of the paradoxes you see in history, especially with war. For example, World War I killed around 15 million people, but penicillin, which was developed as a side effect of World War I, saved hundreds of millions of lives. These are completely dependent upon Europe's influence on the world, given all of these inventions occurred in Europe and its diaspora. One of the other points of the book The Rule of Empires is that the pain of colonialism has much more to do with the power relationships in each colonial country rather than the morality of the people involved. When the British colonized India, they were so outnumbered, around a thousand to one, that they needed to work with the local Indians very closely to control India. When the Spanish colonized Peru, they were terrible, killing off the entire ruling class, enslaving the native population, treating them terribly. However, they were able to do that since the technological and social difference between them was large enough that they could get away with it. The British men in India weren't more moral than the Spanish in Peru, at least by a big margin. Rather, they weren't in a situation where they could get away with being as brutal. You know this is the case because you'll see this across the same empires in the same time period. The Spanish were cruel to the Peruvians since they could, but the Spanish Empire was very kind to Belgium, since Belgium was a colony that was surrounded on all sides by opponents who could seize it, while also being very wealthy, so the Spanish couldn't afford to lose Belgium. Freedom is a market value where, due to a combination of technology, numbers, unified society, military ability, and geography, certain areas can demand much better treatment than others. For this reason, differing regions got very different results from European colonialism, often by the same countries due to having very different circumstances. What we're seeing with colonialism was Europe, for a series of reasons I tackle in this video, had a staggering superiority in technology and society. The European governments didn't plan it, but enterprising groups of Europeans colonized the world. The question is, did this have to happen? And I'd say yes. There are societies that wouldn't have pushed to colonize everything they could, like the Chinese turning inwards in the 1400s, but they also didn't invent anything after that same time. However, the Europeans of our world, who created the modern world, pushing technology forward and more, would have always done it. As Oswald Spengler said, the European spirit that drove to colonize the world was the same that also developed modern science, which saved millions of lives or created Mozart. There are two sides of the same coin. Modernity is colonialism. For an example of the logic of force and practicality that went together with colonialism, we'll look at the colonization of Africa at the end of the 19th century. Europeans hadn't been able to penetrate the African interior, given the local diseases were so terrible. However, with the invention of modern medicine, steamships, and the railroad, the Europeans carved up Africa in a matter of a decade. I've done a lot of research on this topic, which I've covered in this video, and the short answer for why the Europeans did this was that they just could, and the technological difference made it incredibly easy. Less than 5,000 Europeans died in the scramble for Africa. For a reference, that's about 30 seconds of the Battle of the Somme. In the 1960s, the Europeans gave up their African colonies peacefully. The reason was that the Europeans no longer had growing populations that made the colonies make sense, and on top of that, the African colonies weren't profitable. We forget this today, but Europe was losing large amounts of money holding on to Africa, which was lightly populated and poor. In 1900, less than 1% of the British stock market or economy was involved in Africa. The entire British Empire was only 15% of the British stock market and foreign trade and economy, most of which was white colonies like Canada or Australia, followed by India. Colonialism happened not because it was super profitable, but simply because the Europeans could do it. As a final point, people like to say that Europe and the Industrial Revolution and modernity stemmed from colonialism, and there is literally no evidence for this and lots of evidence contrary to it. Europe was already the wealthiest and most technologically advanced place in the world by a significant margin at the end of the Middle Ages, and after colonialism, Europe's economies took off while those of the colonies collapsed, which signified that colonialism was an economic drain to Europe, but a boon to the colonies. There's also no correlation you can run between colonies and wealth. Places with very large colonies, such as Spain or Portugal 
would often fall behind economically. And from everything we see, colonialism was a representation of Europe's advancement and technological and economic superiority rather than being an effect of it. The negatives of European colonialism are common across empires in every society, but at the same time there is no parallel to the better aspects of European colonialism. Europe giving up its colonies peacefully has no parallel in history. It's sad that the Europeans can't be proud or the Africans grateful for doing something that is insanely generous by history's standards. Although the Europeans were deeply brutal, there is no parallel over history to their generosity with their subjects. There's a book named The Barbarous Years about the British colonization of eastern North America in the 1600s. There's an interesting anecdote that Jamestown, the first British colony in America, was run by a man who was sympathetic to the Indians. He signed a peace treaty with them and tried to do goodwill with them. The natives just used this as cover to launch an attack on Jamestown, which killed him. When we backseat drive at history, we forget what it was actually like at the time. The reason people don't trust other groups is because stuff like that's normal. Liking each other and goodwill is strange. However, this story from Jamestown is demonstrative of this European humanitarian impulse that you saw for all of colonialism, which is absent from other cultures. It goes back to the Spanish colonization of the Caribbean, which Bartolomeu de las Casas wrote letters reprimanding the enslavement of the native tribes. The Spanish crown then went to great effort to protect the native population from the conquistadors. One of my favorite eras of history is colonial America, and there is a very clear streak among the British settlers of caring about the natives, and often genuinely like them, even as they fought them. There is no parallel to this in other world cultures. The West humanitarianism is not normal, and we forget that the rest of the world's never gotten on board. The Russians are invading Ukraine now, the Turks are actively building a new empire while oppressing the Kurds, India is oppressing its Muslims in Kashmir, while most societies in Southeast Asia are committing genocide. China is also committing genocide, colonizing ethnic minority regions, and turning itself into an Orwellian state. The humanitarian streak grew in the West as it became wealthier. There's an interesting book named Fairness and Freedom, which talked about the settlement of both America and New Zealand. The wars against the natives were much bloodier in the U.S., while the settlement of New Zealand was peaceful. This is since the Enlightenment changed the worldview from natives being heathens without souls to being part of the universal brotherhood of man. As I've said before, the West isn't special for practicing slavery. Most societies have. It is for abolishing it. The West was the only society that felt guilty for its actions and changed, which is something we forget today. We're confused in that we think the world just magically became moral. The moral arc of history doesn't exist, we make it happen. In the 20th century, the Nazis and Soviets practiced the largest slavery and mass death ever. Social justice is trying to drag us back to witch burnings and medieval senses of heresy and clear of good versus evil. In John Gunter's book where he traveled around 1950s Africa, and he was famous, so he was able to interview all the most important figures in every society, and you would ask these British officials, you put a lot of effort into educating the native peoples, but then the second they become educated, they suddenly become nationalists and start lobbying for independence. And the British officials will say, we do it because it's the right thing to do, and whether or not they become nationalists is their private choice as individuals, and that kind of sense doesn't exist in any other societies, and we need to give the British credit for that. In any other society in history, Gandhi's attempt to shame the British through peaceful non-resistance would have just resulted in him getting hanged by the British government. The fact that that didn't happen suggests a morally much more advanced regime than almost anything else in history. The West did something genuinely great in changing itself for the better and becoming humanitarian. But as other eras of history would have immediately told us, kindness doesn't get you much love in international politics. Countries don't praise the West for this since they're our rivals and they won't love us no matter what we do. That's not how international relations work. Iran and China will always call us the Great Satan, no matter how nice we are. The descendants of the people who freed the slaves and peacefully liberated the colonies shit on them for not going far enough while they did some of those generous acts in history. Kindness turned to weakness in the West. The language of politics is and will always be power and force, no matter how much we don't want to believe that. 
We have forgotten that strength is the language of politics. <sighs> I'll send you all a collective hug at the end of this video, since I think y'all need it. To circle back to the main question of this video, was colonialism good or bad? The short answer is that's not the right metric. Nietzsche talks about how the ancient Greeks had a concept of greatness and weakness that we don't really have today. And with our Abrahamic worldview, we try to shove everything into good or evil. But in the world of politics and power, that's not how things work. In the worldview that the ancient Greeks had, colonialism was clearly great. The Europeans ruled the world for centuries, and their ability to pull that off is absolutely astounding. People will be talking about it for thousands of years from now. However, was it good or bad? And I can't give an answer to that, because millions of people were brutally killed, tortured, and so many worse things by European colonizers. At the same time, the Europeans brought many different innovations and were consistently more humane than their competitors. When all's said and done, I don't think whether or not colonialism was good or evil is a useful metric, because by the standards of individuals, nations always act like sociopaths.